Hello, everyone, and either welcome or welcome back to the Jen the Libertarian podcast. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page, where you do get early access to episodes and exclusive episodes. I will put the link down in the show notes. So depending on when you listen to this episode, either the impeachment of Trump is imminent or will have already had happened. So I wanted to sit down and talk to Todd Hagopian, a former LP chair candidate. Um, He is still currently the chair of the Tulsa region of the Libertarian Party, and he is running for school council in Bixby. I wanted to talk to him about impeachment, our thoughts on impeachment, kind of where we started versus where we're at now, where we think this is going to go in the Senate, and basically just everything kind of surrounding the whole impeachment story, because I feel like it's something that, I mean, obviously I talk about it a lot for the podcast when I do my weekly roundups, but I I don't know. I feel like it's something that is talked about a lot, but not really talked about a lot, if you know what I mean. So I wanted to sit down with Todd and do this interview. So let's go ahead and get into it. All right. So today I'm talking to Todd Hagopian and for prosperity or not prosperity, but posterity um, and maybe prosperity, who knows? Uh, (laughs) We are recording this on Monday, December 16th and barring anything crazy happening on Wednesday, the 18th, Donald Trump will be impeached by the house. So this is happening. And obviously, it is a very controversial topic. So (laughs) I wanted to talk to Todd a little bit about his views on it. We'll talk about my views on it and kind of where we land and where it's it's just such a messy topic. So we'll go ahead. First off, Todd, explain to people (laughs) your feelings on impeachment. Yeah. So throughout the impeachment, um, my opinion was basically, if he had done all the things that they said he did, he deserved to be impeached. However, uh, because of the current political climate, and because there is unlikely to be any removal in the Senate, it was probably all a waste of time. Anyway, that's basically been where I've sat throughout the impeachment. um, As I've watched it all, I have decided that, you know, you, you should take a stance on these things. And as I've learned what I've learned and listened to what I've listened to, you know, I'm firmly in the camp of, yes, he deserves to be impeached. He probably deserves to be removed. That won't happen. Um, but but when something should happen, you should stand up and say it. So that's kind of where I'm at now. And that's where I've been throughout this whole thing, too, because I find this very hard for me personally, because on a philosophical level, yes, I do support at least exploring these charges and seeing if he did do what he's accused of doing. Right. Practically speaking, I know this isn't going to result in removal from office. And the more we go along, the more I kind of have a problem with that, just because of how this whole thing has been approached and just how this has all been decided by everybody involved before even hearing one syllable of testimony. Like everybody had their mind made up and that's, I find that really bothersome too. But at this point we do have our two articles of impeachment, which I, I personally wanted four. My, my predictions were abuse of power, obstruction of justice, which got turned into obstruction of Congress. Um, I wanted one specifically on the impoundments clause, and then I wanted one with soliciting foreign interference into an election. But I got we got two. So and I actually thought they were going to put a bribery one in there, which may have fallen into one of your categories. I'm not sure. Uh, But I was hoping for at least a third one in bribery. And it felt like Democrats got cold feet and got a little too ambitious. It sounds like they they thought that they might not get 100 percent democratic support on it and they also thought that um they might be able to get 51 votes in the senate on the other two so that's what they decided to go with and i think what they're going to end up finding is that they get neither uh they're not going to have 100 percent support on the democratic side obviously because the the one gentleman already uh jumped ship Mm -hmm. and then they're not going to get 51 votes in the senate and so they should have probably gone with three to five 
articles uh, and just taken their win in the House because they're not going to get one in the Senate. And everyone knew that to begin with. Yeah, that would be my preference. But on the bribery part, um, I haven't had a chance to really look over it too much yet. But House Judiciary did release, I guess you would call it an addendum to their original report discussing more thoroughly as far as specifically on the two articles of impeachment, why they feel like they're impeachable offenses. And it seems like they're going to stick bribery in with the abuse of power. Oh, is that right? Okay, that makes more sense then. Yeah, they're going to kind of shoehorn it into there. I don't know if impoundment is ever going to come up. I don't know if foreign interference is going to come up, but I guess that remains to be seen. So since we only have two, um, let me get your thoughts. Um, abuse of power. Um, what is your feelings on that? Do you feel like Donald Trump did abuse his power as president of the United States in this particular instance? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's clear, especially if, if we're going to put bribery into that bucket. I would say it it is very clear that basically, you know, around the beginning of 18, whenever Biden was to have started bragging about um, getting this gentleman fired, you know what I mean, um, at, as a Ukraine prosecutor general. Right around that time, Trump, uh, Giuliani, and Parnas, uh, the guy who's been now indicted on federal you know, campaign charges, uh, really started looking into Ukraine and looking into, um, I'm going to probably butcher this name, but Yov- Yovanovitch. Um, and, and I mean, this went on for a year. They went, they went after her. They went after this investigation. And it wasn't until um, Biden really got serious about the presidency and there was something that they could dangle over Ukraine's head that it turned into something where they could take action on. But as soon as they had something, they took action and influenced a foreign government um, with hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and I think it's, I mean, it's as clear cut as I can see it from a motivation standpoint, they worked on it for a whole year. And then as soon as they had something that they could use, they used it uh, to their advantage. And that's, I mean, that's exactly what the charge is. And I do agree with that. And I would add that as far as the abuse of power is concerned, even going to the July 25th call, like everybody seems to be misconstruing what the asks were in that call. He wasn't asking for an investigation into election interference. He wasn't asking for an investigation into corruption writ large in Ukraine. He was asking for Zelensky to pursue this bizarre conspiracy theory that there's a physical DNC email server somewhere in Ukraine. And could you please go get it for me? (laughs) And also, could you look specifically into Burisma specifically because of Hunter Biden? And to me, and people have argued whether Zelensky knew about the aid being held up at the time of the phone call, whether he found out before or after. We know the aid was held up before the phone call. It was held up a month before the phone call. Other people knew that the aid was held up. So, I mean, it's everybody focuses on the fact that nobody ever really said quid pro quo or really spelled it out. But like, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. No. And I think, I think the evidence is, is that Ukraine actually reached out multiple times that day prior to the phone call to try and figure out what was going on with the aid. I think is what uh, the emails are showing now, but even so, I mean, having Donald Trump on a phone call where he actually would spell out quid pro quo is about as dumb as anybody could think, right? They, he knows he's got 15 people on the phone. Um, but, but even so he still spelled out, <laughs> um, Biden, Burisma <laughs> and, and aid, you know what I mean? So even though he knew 15 people were on the phone, he knew it was being recorded. Uh, it was an official state call. He still went so far as to to essentially talk about quid pro quo without actually saying the words. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's just it blows my mind that he would think, and 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 the fact that the whistleblower came right after that, and the fact that everybody that that has commented on the call said it was inappropriate, is just it blows my mind that he would do that with that many witnesses right there. Yeah, it's it's just. I mean, we're not talking about a smart man here when we're talking about Trump, but even he's not stupid enough to be like, listen, unless you do these things for me, I'm not going to give you the money. Right. 
<laughs> but he clearly told that to his aides because that's exactly what he said on the phone call. Yeah. <laughs> with Sunderland, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it, those the conversations obviously took place prior to this call. And then in this call, um, he just needed to reiterate it. And, and, you know, it appears that he did very, uh, very clearly. And it appears that Zelensky basically said, yes, yes, you know, we, we want to be on United States good side. <laughs> and for what it's worth, Zelensky still has not got his meet with Trump. <laughs> nor, nor will he probably know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know at this point. He still has not met with Trump. <laughs> But what I found interesting during listening to everybody's testimony was that this this concern about this phone call and this concern about the hold about the funds started way before anybody knew about the whistleblower complaint. Like it was almost immediately people were voicing concerns that like, hey, something ain't right here. And even OMB was like, wait, why? Why are we holding up these funds? Like, what's what's the justification? What are we doing here? So. Even from the jump, there were people that were voicing concerns, even though they weren't doing it publicly. But yeah, this set off bells for everybody involved. So yeah. it's, it's like how, like how, how do you square this? Like I just I don't, right. I don't I don't get it. But well, I mean, and days after Taylor and Sumland, I believe, had the mm-hmm. text message exchange, where where someone basically said, "Hey, if you." If you really have a problem with this, you have to go talk to so and so. But let's stop the text message. I mean, like literally, yeah. let's stop the <laughs> evidence chain. You know, <laughs> it's basically what he said. And and days later, the eight got released. You know what I mean? Because I think they started to realize that people were not only were there text messages, people were having legitimate concerns and saying the words "quid pro quo." You know, on <laughs> on official. Uh, documents and I think people just uh, it, it just surprises me the phone call itself just shows that yes Trump brought it up personally but all the other stuff I mean withholding the aid um, sending aides to go talk to Zelensky and prep him for the phone call uh, other aides not being informed when they should have that aid was being you know held back and then those aides bringing up quid pro quo specifically saying this is ridiculous, we shouldn't be helping domestic political campaigns, you know, um, in exchange for aid. I mean, all those things are what we should be focusing on. And everyone's focused on the quote unquote transcript, which isn't the transcript of this one call. Yeah, and I, I think on the second charge, I mean, even if you want to try to make some kind of argument that Trump was well within his right as president to make these asks and to hold up this money. I mean, obviously Mm -hmm. I disagree with that. The obstruction charge. I don't know how anybody argues that that hasn't happened. Right. The white house has been incredibly (laughs) explicit. Like there are are two letters that I know of from white house counsel saying that we are not cooperating with the house investigation. (laughs) They have been very explicit in saying, we have instructed the State Department to not release documents. We have right. told people who have been subpoenaed to not go testify. I don't know what else you call that. Right. And I don't actually know what makes up that charge, meaning what, what qualifies and what doesn't. Uh, but all the things that you said are true. And if that qualifies as obstruction of Congress, then then I don't know how you can argue any differently. Even people that have been fired from the administration or have resigned have been, you know, stopped from testifying it would have been awesome to hear you know although i hate the person it would have been awesome to hear what bolton had to say about this whole thing you know yeah or giuliani or trump himself you know any one of those people could have actually mounted a defense rather than talked about how it was a witch hunt the entire time and talked about process yeah and i i hold out hope that somebody will testify in the senate although i'm not holding my breath right but it's just (laughs) On the, on the obstruction one, I don't know how anybody argues that that didn't happen because they've right. been very explicit. Like, I just, there's so much about this that just kind of blows my mind. And it's, maybe it's just the, the onslaught of information and just stuff every day that people forget. The little things like the fact that they've already admitted to a lot of this stuff in public. <laughs> yeah. Like, point blank have admitted to doing this. Like Mick Mulvaney got up 
in a press conference in front of a hot mic and said, yes, one of the reasons we held up Ukrainian aid was to force them to investigate these things and you need to get over it. Yeah. And then Giuliani, I think it was just today or yesterday, came up and said, yes, we had to get uh, Yovonovich out of the way in order to get this investigation looked. I mean, it's the things that they're saying out loud and on camera are just uh, you can only imagine what they're saying in private. You know, and we're hearing some of that throughout the testimony, but you can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's just mind blowing how much has already been admitted to, and it's just like everybody kind of glosses over it, and it's just it's <laughs> it's it's so weird to me. But <laughs> but I I do want to talk about, especially on obstruction, yeah. the the amount of pressure that the White House has put on key witnesses and on the State Department to not cooperate. Just to kind of put it in historical context, even Nixon didn't go this far. Right. Like, even Nixon didn't try this. So this is just like unprecedented. And it's... I mean, <laughs> when you've got somebody, a president that has 62 million, you know, or something like that, Twitter followers, and he's just bashing a witness who's who's testifying live and and just basically egging on all of his supporters to go after them. Um, I mean, that is intimidation, in my opinion. I, I don't know how you can put it any other way um, than he's intimidating witnesses before, during, and after their testimony. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's incredible what he's doing to the witnesses and then, and then his own people. I mean, everyone knows what they'll suffer if they turn their back on Trump. I think it's clear what happens to you when you do that. Yeah, and especially when you got guys like Giuliani, which this is pretty much all he's got left. Right. Like, yeah. it, you, you turn on Trump, you're, I mean, there's there's nothing left for you. Yeah. And I guess Bolton's saving it for the book. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what Pompeo and Mulvaney are thinking. They might be able to salvage themselves if they testified. <laughs> I, I just uh, yeah. <laughs> sounds like Pompeo is going to run for something else and try and get his name attached to something else. I think Giuliani is screwed at this point. This is going to be what he's remembered for after, you know, all of his heroics in New York and whatnot, uh, quote unquote heroics. You know, this is what he's going to be remembered for now is just a bumbling lawyer who said all the wrong things. But because he was completely 100 percent faithful, you know, Trump liked him right up until Trump lets him go to jail. Yeah, and I still maintain that Rudy's going to get thrown under the bus eventually by Trump. Like, there's yeah. just no way it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, he already said uh, he's not worried about getting thrown under the bus because he has insurance. And then he explained that what he meant was he actually has, you know, life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure that's exactly what he meant. He has nothing, no dirt on the president. He was actually talking about life insurance <laughs> when he made that come. <laughs> does, does he also have health and auto insurance yeah, too? exactly. Yeah, I think it was the whole Geico combination in there that he was talking about. When like, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> well, allegedly he's not getting paid for this, so maybe that's how he's going to make money now. He's going to be a Geico spokesman. Well, you know, he made a lot of money when Parnas hired Giuliani uh, and the Giuliani group. So he's made quite a bit of money from folks who uh, got paid by the Russians to interfere in elections. So we'll see. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't need Trump's money. Yeah, that's that's kind of another thing that I think I, I, I wonder why people kind of don't talk about things as much as they do. And I think especially with this particular impeachment process, it's a really difficult one because it's, it's hard to follow. Like it's yeah. really hard to understand and keep track of like, I do it for the podcast. And even some days I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What, what are we doing? Who, who did yeah. what to who? <laughs> so people who kind of have a more surface level kind of following of this are, are like, what, who did what <laughs> to who and what, why, who? And, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the hardest parts about this is is the history of it. You know, if you go way back and Ukraine just a handful of years ago um, was basically a pro-Russian company, a country, um, you know, the, the leader at the time goes and kills 70 protesters and flees to Russia. Russia invades Crimea, you know, invades a couple other cities. 
um, and then a, a pro-West government gets voted in. And ever since that moment, they're, they've been fighting or trying to fight corruption extremely unsuccessfully, right? And so people don't know the history of this. And and the, the Burisma thing very well may be corruption. I mean, if you actually look into it, I am not one of those people that's like Biden's son didn't do anything. It looks pretty shady. Um, he, you know, he, he suddenly, he got evicted from the military for doing cocaine. Suddenly he was a board member at a guy who no one knows how got rich, you know, owns this big company. Um, and, and they do a number of investigations into him and nobody can find anything or tries to find anything. I mean, that all is pretty shady. And so I get where the skepticism is, but what you have to do is put that aside and say, did Trump break the law? You know, that could all be shady. It could actually be the real deal. It could be that he was corrupt and the company was corrupt, but that still doesn't allow you to break the law and and influence foreign powers for your own you know political benefit. And people really stick on the Hunter Biden thing because it's like, oh, well, he got his job because of his last name. It's like, yeah, nobody's denying that. It's yeah. nepotism. Yeah. We know no, how we got the job. Got, he probably got the job because he was so good at doing coke, right? Like, <laughs> obviously, he got it because he was Hunter Biden, you know, and I mean, that's it's a no brainer. And there's probably something there. And and that's fine. And I, I, you know, people are like, well, hey, you know, do you support Hunter Biden getting investigated? Yes. You know, yeah, go ahead and investigate them. <laughs> I mean, they have been investigated multiple times. I'd like to think that they did it the right way. They probably didn't. So go ahead and investigate them again. But you know what? Let Ukraine do that with Ukraine dollars because uh, it doesn't really matter to us. But more importantly, you know, did the president commit impeachable acts? That can happen whether or not Hunter Biden was corrupt or not. Yeah, and if and if it was really something that you wanted to pursue on the up and up on the U.S. side, I mean, Hunter Biden is a U.S. citizen. You right. could call the FBI, you could call State Department, you could call the Department yeah. of Justice. Like, there's plenty of legitimate <laughs> ways in which you can investigate Hunter Biden that don't even involve Ukraine. <laughs> this country that Donald Trump keeps saying is so awful and corrupt, like, well, then why do you want them doing anything? Right. <laughs> well, and, that, and the other part of this is, I mean, they were being investigated. Burisma was being investigated the year Hunter Biden w came on board. You know what I mean? They were getting investigated for things that happened way before Hunter Biden. And then he was on board for, you know, about four years. So it's not like, I mean, he, he could he have done something wrong? Sure. But that wasn't even the source of the original Burisma investigations. What they were trying to figure out is how did this guy get his money and did he steal it from politics? And all that happened prior to him uh, taking on Hunter Biden and, and starting this company. So it's just kind of funny. They, I mean, yes, he's he got his he got the job because of who he was and he joined a company that seems really shady. Um, none of that makes it okay to commit impeachable offenses. And I will freely admit that Hunter Biden was probably hired and put on the board to try to get some kind of insurance policy, but that failed miserably, however much they were paying this guy, because it still ended up that Joe Biden, his dad, at the behest of his boss, Barack Obama, with the yeah. backing of the whole Western world, ended up going to Ukraine and getting this prosecutor fired because right. he wasn't investigating fast enough. Right. <laughs> and then what did Trump do with this prosecutor? Oh, well, good old buddy Parnas um, and Giuliani get on phone calls with this prosecutor throughout that year. Between 2018 and 2019, multiple phone calls with this prosecutor. And that's the guy that, won't, that can't get a visa to come and testify. And that's the reason that they're using, that they said they had to get Yovanovitch out of there. So, I mean, it's <laughs> they literally this guy who got fired because the entire Western world said he would not prosecute Burisma is the one that they're trying to say. He's the one that knows how corrupt this Burisma is, but he didn't prosecute him. <laughs> it's, it's really odd. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch it kind of be not reported in U.S. media, but kind of the way that these things kind of filter out through the internet and social media and how people compare 
what Biden did to what Trump did and basically saying it's the same thing. It's like, no, it's not the same thing right. at all. <laughs> Two entirely different things. Well, and the, and the problem with media in general, right, is that they treat everybody like they have to talk to the lowest common denominator, right? So the people who know anything about the impeachment proceedings um, know more than what the media is saying. What the media is saying is Trump did something wrong or is accused of something wrong. Biden's accused of something wrong. And people people who are Republican are going to say, well, they both did something wrong. So neutral, you know, doesn't matter. We should, we should investigate Biden and the people on the uh, Democrat side are saying, okay, well, let's impeach Trump. No one bothers to do any research to figure out what the whole story is. I bet you nobody, the average person can't tell you anything about Burisma. Uh, the average person thinks that Trump is getting impeached over a phone call. You know what I mean? People just don't care to go one inch deeper and the media doesn't care to either. Um, so it, it's just sad. It's kind of a sad situation that we're talking about the removal of a president and people don't care enough to spend a half hour to dig a little deeper. Yeah, that that bothers me. Like this whole process is really starting to bother me deeply as to how both Democrats and Republicans are responding to it and kind of how the public writ large it's it's almost like this isn't happening. And yeah. I'm just like there's an impeachment going on, guys. This is kind of a big deal, I do think. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you remember the last one? I mean, I remember I was in, I believe I was in high school. Yeah, I was in high school when Clinton was going through this. And I just remember following it intently. And I was a pretty hardcore conservative at the time. And I lived in a very, very liberal town. And I just remember thinking to myself, why is it not a big deal that the president lied under oath? You know what I mean? And then I remember everybody around me was just like, why do we care about X, Y, Z? You know, why, why do we care about the president's intern blowjob? And I was just like, yeah, but he lied under oath. And, and it, but it was uh, almost the same. And I, and I can't put a good comparison to it because I just wasn't as involved in the media at that point. So I don't know what it played out on TV, but it was very, very similar uh, in my eyes from a, from a how people took it standpoint. You know, they, they worried about, the actual um, what happened, but not the action that the president took that was wrong. Uh, and it feels like it's happening again just on the other side. And the exact same people who were saying before that the, you know, lying under oath was incredibly bad are now saying that the um, influencing a foreign power is not a big deal at all. <laughs> and, and I can kind of get the argument that there's shades here like okay yes Clinton right. lied under oath perjury is perjury right. is perjury that's breaking right. the law right. but right. I can I can understand people be like oh he lied about an affair with right. an intern who cares yeah. but I'm like okay this is the president of the United <laughs> States being accused of unilaterally withholding U.S. funds <laughs> in order to do something that absent any other plausible explanation was solely for his benefit right. this is to way more this yeah. is way more serious <laughs> yeah it does <laughs> it seems like you could certainly make the argument that uh trying to win an election you know is more serious than um than what clinton was doing at the time <laughs> yeah people were just kind of dismiss it. and even today i saw a tweet where somebody said that Clinton got impeached for having sex in the Oval Office. Like, that's not exactly yeah. what happened. <laughs> that's not exactly it. It's that he lied about it. That yeah. was the problem. Yeah. And not only to Congress, but if you remember, he lied, you know, on national TV, and I on did, national broadcast, you know. He I did not himself. have sex with that woman. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember watching that and I remember just shaking my head and be like, you better not have because you're screwed now. <laughs> like, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to me that people, uh, I mean, even they have, you know, McConnell now is saying no witnesses in the Senate trial. And of course, they've got footage of him back in, in the Clinton days saying we need to have at least three witnesses. That is not a unreasonable request when somebody's trying to get impeached. <laughs> and so, so it's like, okay, so Clinton, you know, perjured himself and you, you thought three witnesses was okay. Trump withheld hundreds of millions of dollars so that he could get elected again. 
and you think no witnesses is fine. That's no big deal. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, the people who have been in the House and the Senate long enough, it just cracks me up how hypocritical they are looking throughout this whole thing. But they'll keep getting elected because no one's watching it close enough. Yeah, and I seem to remember, like, I was in my early teens when the Clinton impeachment was happening, but it seemed like it was just much more, like, wall to wall, just everybody talking about it. And, yeah. well, it, it's a lot easier to talk about a presidential sex scandal than it is about Ukrainian aid deals and ambassadors and yeah. things and stuff. <laughs> it, it's yeah. not a very sexy story. It's a, it's a little hard to sell. So. Right, right. Yeah, and I mean, I think it was... It's pretty black and white. You know, did he do this and that? did he lie about it? And here it's, again, people focus on the phone call because it's the easiest thing for the American public to to remember about the case. Everything else is, you know, so hard to follow unless you want to follow it. Even the people who try and follow it get everything wrong. You know, you talk to somebody and they still spin it their own partisan way um, as they as they watch a day's worth of hearings, you know. And, and if you watch the nightly news, all you get is the four minutes of the hearing that um, that affects, you know, the left if you watch MSNBC or the right if you watch Fox News. So it, it just spins it your way anyway, and you end up hearing what you want to hear. Yeah, and it's just so hard, especially when these hearings go eight, nine, ten hours a day. It's just like, <laughs> at some point, like, I, I watched a lot of them. I've not kept up with the past week because it just got to a point where I'm like, there's nothing new being, right. there's nothing new here. There's no new yeah. information being offered. <laughs> and it's just people yelling at each other. And I'm just like, I can't like call me when we get back to something important. But right. <laughs> moving on from there, I want to talk about the impoundments clause, because I feel like this is an aspect that is getting really underreported. And to me, this would be for everybody who is like, well, you can't impeach the president unless you can show he's committed a criminal offense. Well, breaking the impoundments clause would be a criminal offense. And one of the reasons I kind of wanted this as its own sort of article of impeachment is that if you are going to argue that he did not violate the impoundments clause, then I want to hear what your argument would be to justify that and to say what would be violating the impoundments clause. Because... I mean, the clause is very clear about what the president is supposed to do if he feels like certain aid money should not be distributed. And that's not unilaterally hold it up. That's go talk to Congress, which that didn't happen. Right. right. <laughs> and, and didn't give a reason, didn't give notification. He just held it up. Even the people that were closest to the action didn't know why it was getting held up, except if you were in the president's inner circle. So, I mean, you're right. It, it's I, it's probably not in there because people don't understand it. You know what I mean? Um, it's probably why the Democrats didn't put it in or the Democrats don't understand it. Or they know that Barack Obama probably violated this clause, you know, a hundred times and they just don't want to get into something where people can show five examples of where that happens would be my guess. I, I would like to see it taken up as kind of, in the way of kind of like doing a case law sort of thing of trying to yeah. explain like, okay, what, what is and is not a violation. Cause to me, obviously this is a violation. Um, there's like you said, there's been no explanation given as to why it was held up and then why it was released. Everybody was on board with the, with the funds being released in the first place. Ukraine had satisf satisfied the Pentagon's, sort of checklist for anti-corruption activities. So they were on board. Congress was on board. State Department was on board. OMB was on board. And then all of a sudden, Trump's like, we're not doing this. And everyone's like, right. what? <laughs> and there's still not been an explanation given. Right. I, just, I, I don't know why nobody's asking for an explanation for this. <laughs> well, I think, uh, honestly, I, I can remember times where Obama withheld aid, you know, to certain countries. And I, I'm trying to think of examples. I could probably Google some, but but I know, you know, presidents have withheld aid before. And I think it's probably just gets down to um, being one of those things that everybody in the country believes that they should be able to do, um, especially, you know, libertarians and conservatives. I always think you should be able to withhold aid, you know, because they don't believe in the aid to begin with. 
Um, and, and so I'm guessing that that's why it's not being talked about as much, because um, if if Trump came out and said I withheld aid because they weren't investigating corruption, you know, a heavy portion of his space and probably even some Democrats would be like, yeah, you know, I could see that. Uh, even though you're right, there's a process for how to do that, and it certainly wasn't followed. Yeah, and I wouldn't mind if the aid was held up in Congress because that's Congress's right. job. Exactly. Yeah. To me, if you're going to argue that this is the role of the executive branch and that the executive branch can just unilaterally withhold whatever funds they want for whatever reason they want, then yeah. I'm running for president. Yeah, and <laughs> and you know what? Then you can't complain about entitlements because just go ahead and withhold your Social Security aid. You know, and your Medicare aid and your Obamacare aid, like, why not just withhold all kinds of stuff, you know, if that's something that the president can do? And aren't there a few more things more important than getting reelected that he could have withheld? You know, so, I mean, there's certainly a good argument there. It's certainly interesting. If somebody were to put a case together, I'd like to see, you know, all the different times that that clause has been violated by the different presidents. Although I am certainly not in favor of the argument that you know, all presidents should have been impeached by because X, Y, Z. So therefore, we shouldn't impeach Donald Trump. My my thought on that argument is, is if other presidents were guilty, then they should have been impeached. So <laughs> it doesn't, we should just use that as a reason to never impeach another president, no matter what he does. And that's an argument that I see a lot that really kind of infuriates me because like yeah. okay well at what point do you want to start holding the executive branch responsible for its actions like i don't have a time machine i can't right. go back and impeach obama and bush two and clinton right. and bush one and reagan i we have what we have right here right now and right. saying that just because these presidents did a thing and didn't get impeached that, that so that takes impeachment off the table for forever Right. Like I don't, yeah. I don't understand this argument. <laughs> it's like so people didn't have courage to impeach them back then. Got it, you know. <laughs> it's like, and the and the other thing is they don't, they don't actually list impeachable offenses when they talk about it. They just say, you know, this guy, this guy did this. This guy started that war. This guy did this. I mean, you know, we can all, I mean, we can all say that a bunch of presidents should have been impeached, but they have to actually um, commit impeachable offenses. You know, <laughs> so that's what the whole impeachment trial is about. And I mean, I'm sure if we all sat down, we could all at least come up with at least one thing that each president yeah. did that could be an impeachable offense. Like if I was going with yeah. Obama, I'd probably go yeah. with Fast and Furious. Right. <laughs> I mean, if you want to keep going back, I mean, we can find stuff for every president. But I mean, I, it's, I, OK, that sucks that they weren't impeached. Right. <laughs> but what 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 about right now? What about this right. president who allegedly did a thing right. like okay so he doesn't get impeached i'm very confused yeah and if we're really going to make it okay to mess with you know our elections going forward forget forget the russia thing or whatever i mean if you're if you're using a uh, tax dollars to influence um an investigation that's going to hurt one of your rivals who, who, by the way, announced for the president just months before this, you know, and was the leading candidate that, at the time. I mean, that if we're really going to make it okay to use tax dollars to influence your own reelection campaign, uh, that's going to be a pretty slippery slope. I mean, there's four point, you know, five trillion dollar budget. It's only going to take X amount of million, hundreds of millions, to influence an election. <laughs> It'd be real easy to hide if that becomes commonplace, and we're not going to impeach over it. True. And the the kind of the last thing I want to talk about and kind of wrap up on is going forward as to what the Senate trial is going to look like, because at this point, it's very up in the air. I know, I think Chuck Schumer issued a letter to Mitch McConnell giving an outline of what he would like to see happen. Yeah. But seeing as, I mean, there's already been reports that Mitch McConnell may not even call a single witness. He may just automatically bring this to a vote as soon as it hits the hits their floor. Yeah. I've seen people float the idea that, well, the House can vote for impeachment and then just basically sit on it and not submit it to the Senate until such a time as the Senate at least acts like there's going to be an impartial trial because we are not there at all at this point. 
Right. In fact, you've got Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham going out in public saying <laughs> that, um, yeah, we're not going to be impartial. And yeah. your job here is to be impartial. You're supposed to be a juror if we're yeah. comparing this to a criminal trial. Like if a juror went out in public and said, you know what? No, I've already decided in in favor of the defendant. Everyone would be like, what? Right. <laughs> like, you, you what? <laughs> and I think I think both sides are playing it wrong. Like the Democrats could be talking exactly how you are and say, OK, the Senate is supposed to be. Uh, and in a trial. And here are 35 examples of people who have already made up their mind before they hear any witnesses. And by the way, they're not going to listen to any witnesses. And they could be presenting that in that way to the American public, but they're not. They're just, um, you know, uh, she was out there talking about it, but they're not presenting it in that way. And I think what's going to end up happening here, I don't think they're going to sit on it because then the Democrats are just going to be accused of playing politics I think the Democrats and the whole reason I think they went after two articles instead of more is because they truly believe they can get Collins, um, possibly Romney, um, and possibly, I think it's Murkowski, to potentially flip. And I think they're wrong. And I think McConnell's going to be able to acquit this thing, which is something that they could not do against Clinton, where they just get 51 votes to say nope. We're actually, not only are we finding him not guilty or not enough to incriminate, we're going to find him innocent in the trial. And that's going to be a huge, huge black eye on the Democrats uh, for this entire thing. And so obviously I'm, I'm for impeachment, but I think that the way this is all playing out, um, Republicans have done this to him before. They're going to kind of get the feel that they'll be able to flip one of these guys or two of these guys and get it down. Um and then it's not going to happen, and they're going to look really, really foolish when it gets acquitted and no no witnesses get brought. I think maybe you can get Romney. I don't know about anybody else. But the thing that really bothers me, especially with how the Senate trial is going to go down and with kind of public sentiment on this in general, is the lack of, I guess for a better term, intellectual curiosity into trying to find out did this happen? Like, did right. this go down the way that it's been described? Like, I feel like that should be kind of an important thing to find out, but right. nobody seems particularly <laughs> interested in finding that out. Like, I don't, I don't understand why. I mean, if Republicans deep down in their heart of hearts feel like Donald Trump did nothing wrong, the phone call was perfect, everything's fine, why wouldn't you be subpoenaing Mulvaney? Giuliani, right. Bolton, Pence, just everybody involved with this to have them testify to the fact that, no, this was all fine and good and on the up and up. I mean, it's just it's it's just such a bad look. And I don't like it just just the pure partisanshipness of it. It's just it's kind of a cynicism that's bordering on nihilism that really just is starting to bother me both yeah. within the Republican Party and the, re the reactions to the Democrats and just writ large, especially people in the libertarian movement who are watching this, who just kind of either what about us on this or or make the, the argument of other presidents or, well, it's the state or it's the CIA or it's this or it's that. It's like, but are you not curious to find out if this actually happened? Right. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, one of the problems is is uh, the people that you just named that they would call Republicans are actually more closely aligned to them than they are to Trump. I think they're loyal to Trump just because they have to be in order to keep their job. But all the people you just named have been in the swamp for years. You know what I mean? I, I honestly, I don't think Romney is going to vote for impeachment. I think that he likes to be on the winning side um, and he's going to end up going ahead and, and voting to stay. I think I think you've got a chance in Collins, unless she's scared that um, that, that Lamont's guy or whatever is going to run against her, uh, but you got a chance in her. And I, I think um, I think Romney's going to come out and say he's he did some bad things. I wouldn't like it, but it's not worthy of being impeached. Uh, and you're not going to have one good, strong Republican voice um, that that's in favor of it. It's just going to be, I think it's going to be terrible for the Dems because 
they didn't get the right kind of coverage the whole time that they were doing this. And now uh, the final, it's going to kind of go out with a whimper. Yeah, and I, I would say that the Democrats haven't done a good job of messaging, but honestly, it wouldn't have mattered. Right. Because it's yeah. – every like, the, the die was already cast. Like, everybody right. already knew that this is not going to make it through the Senate. And Nancy Pelosi, for her part, I feel like she's always known that and that that's why she was always a bit reticent to even kind of go down this road. But once the whistleblower complaint became public, you kind of couldn't right. you couldn't yeah. not do this. Like it it kind of right. set things in motion that she didn't have control over anymore. Yeah. And yeah. So, and I think she probably could have played it a little slower, which would have been better. You know what I mean? And just done more investigation prior to the impeachment. Um, but I think. Yeah, you're right. It, you know, if it, this is like we said, it's either impeachable or it's not. And once the whistleblower came out, uh, it, it was clear if you believe that that actually happened, that it was an impeachable offense. Yeah, and I, I understand the argument of trying to slow it down and maybe trying to yeah. go through the courts to try to get some of these people who have been subpoenaed to show up. My whole thing is. At what point do you accept that somebody is not going to cooperate with your investigation? At what point do you take them at their word? Because, right. of course, the White House, I mean, they would take this all the way up to the Supreme Court to try to fight sure. people being yeah. having to obey a congressional subpoena, which right there, like, OK, the executive <laughs> branch feels like they don't have to obey congressional subpoenas now. Like, really? Right. And even then, even if the Supreme Court said, yes, you have to obey the congressional subpoena, your butt has to be in this chair, in this room at this time, you're still not going to get testimony because you can't right. compel people yeah. to testify. Right. Yeah. Like, like you can make them be in the chair, but you can't make them open their mouths and have words come out. So you can and drag can this. Tell you. <laughs> you certainly can't tell. I think convince them to tell the truth. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, you, you could have dragged this out for another <laughs> God knows how long and still not have gotten that testimony that you were looking right. for. Yeah. So that's been my thing. It's like, okay, when do you, when do you cut bait and say, all right, well, you're not cooperating. You've made that very clear. So we're moving on without you. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think, I think you had a good point earlier. I mean, I think their best, their best move right now would just be to show what a sham the Senate election is. Say we had, you know, 18 people come and testify. The Senate had zero. You know, we had 200 and some odd votes for impeachment. Um, the Senate, you know, they voted across party lines. Nobody even listened to any evidence. You know, I think that's probably the only way they get out of this, showing that they put more due diligence into it. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's not, you know, it's not my job to tell the Democrats how, how to look better in all this. It's just, I think, what's unfortunate about this is it just shows that the entire impeachment proceedings were a waste of time, even though they weren't. This is the kind of thing that we should be doing when a president does something or is accused of doing something of this magnitude. But now everyone's just going to look at impeachment as being a waste of time. And the next time a president does something like this, the only way that it'll ever uh, get the attention it deserves is if the other party owns the two houses. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right. <laughs> Yeah. Although I, I I have come down on the side of thinking that there was value in doing this, even though it's not going to end up in any kind of good way that anybody's going to feel good about or should feel good about, if we're being completely honest. But yeah. I, I guess this is instructive in a way right. of where we're at right now politically, not that it's a very good message or a very uplifting message. Right. <laughs> but I guess it's better to know that this is, this is it. Like, okay, they're, the GOP <laughs> is going to go down with the Trump ship and okay, yeah. I guess, bye. <laughs> <laughs> go, go on. I mean, it, it's going to, I think it'll be interesting to see how people react when, uh, when folks that we, you know, we as libertarians and, uh, deeply respect and how they react when those folks vote against the impeachment and just what words are they saying? You know, the masses of the world, the leaders of the world, uh, you know, what, what words are they saying that makes it okay to do what they did? Uh, Cause we know Amash is going to vote uh, for the impeachment. 
and the other people are likely going to vote against it. And I'm just I'm curious as to what everyone's going to say. What is Rand Paul going to say on why it's okay to hold hundreds of million dollars over somebody's head while asking for them to investigate your political opponent? I just want to hear that justification. I don't think we'll get it. Um, but but I think to your point, that's one value that'll come out of this is is people get to show their true colors and we'll get to hear a little bit about it. I think another value that came out of it is when I first heard the tape, I was like, nah, that's not impeachable. You know what I mean? If that's all they've got, that's not impeachable. But as we went through the witness list and as we saw the run up to it and all the activities that went around for the year beforehand, you know, I mean, I think I think then it became clear that it was. So I think there was value in it for people on the line like me, you know, to to go deeper and to listen and to understand what actually happened and formed a more educated opinion. Yeah, and I think on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because we've we've gone on for quite a while. So, yeah. <laughs> um, do you? Sorry, do you, I had to do that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is what happens when talky people talk. <laughs> um, do you have anything you want to plug? Your Twitter? Anything you got going on? No, I'm good. I think most people know where to find me at Todd Hagopian on Twitter, Libertarian in Chief. Um, I am running for school board in Bixby uh, after dropping out of the LP chairs race. Uh, So I'm looking forward to that. But other than that, I just, um, I am overly opinionated on Twitter and uh, and feel free to reach out to me there and and argue with me as you will. All right. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me, Todd. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So that was my chat with Todd. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are not going to agree with some of the things that we said or some of the positions we took, and that's okay. That's fine. You can disagree. It's cool. But like I said, I did want to make this episode mainly because I wanted to have this discussion with somebody. So Todd was willing enough to sit down and have it with me. So thank you once again to Todd. And as always, if you did make it this far, thank you. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page. Take care and until next time.